Very often we think about algorithms as technological entities, when I think, in fact, it's not self-evident that they are. Before I get into sort of how I see algorithms, I think that it might be useful to just say a thing or two about um, or address certain prevailing myths um, about algorithms, so in general. Um, so first of all, I think that algorithms are not just math, code, or a set of instructions telling the machine what to do. Um, clinging on to notions of, for instance, recipe, um, which is which is one of the most sort of used analogies for explaining what algorithms are. While they might be true for sort of rule-based algorithms, I think we don't get um, too far by sort of um, leaving it at that, right? They're, they're much more than recipes. Algorithms are multiples in the sense that how they emerge in specific situations really varies. So let's imagine that I'll have to make my mom's famous lasagna dish from memory um, since I've lost that recipe. Um, what I'll do is probably to try it out a few times, perhaps uh, over dinner parties with friends um, in non-COVID times, of course. And then sort of little by little, perfect the dish, um, try it out, uh, incorporate the feedback of, of my friends and, and sort of by, by trial and error. Uh, and then in the end, I hopefully uh, am able to make a sort of fairly decent dish, which personally is quite a feat because I barely know how to boil an egg, but that's another story. Um, so let's imagine then that you and your friends uh, will have to sort of make the same lasagna in the same way. Um, now I'm sure that we will pretty much end up with, with different dishes. They might be called lasagna, um, but they're different. And I think that's exactly how sort of machine learning works in that it's not so much the recipe but a procedure for recipe. What the end result is really depends on how it was trained, the kind of examples that were given, uh, how long it took to perfect, the kind of feedback, um, the procedure, and so on. And so in the end, you'll end up with sort of an acceptable answer. Um, and the, the dish will be sort of the same. It will be called lasagna but it's not the same. It's not the same in each instance. So in a way, I would rather think of algorithms as uh, more of an assemblage um, or arrangement, specifically in terms of machine learning algorithms, then I think they're much more generative agents in and of themselves. Um, so not, not none of these rule-based instructions um, but really a uh, phenomena and entity that also evolve in terms of what else they, they get in touch with, um, the, the sorts of histories and legacies and moments that linger within them and the kinds of future that they will open up or preempt. Thinking about it relationally and as, as sort of events, um, I think, has been more fruitful and more, um, more useful uh, because it does not sort of assume uh, an inside or an outside of algorithms, but really thinks of it as something that contributes to making the world as, as it sort of works on the world. Very often we think about algorithms as technological entities. Um, when I think in fact, it's not self-evident that they are. Right. And because they're per default treated as if they're purely technical um, and the idea of the technical object as something mechanical is very, very often um, what's emphasized humans or the uh, sort of the, the human aspects of these entities is very often sort of left outside of these formal definitions of what an algorithm is. Um, 
And to me, there is no obvious reason for that. In one of my case studies in the book, I talk about uh, journalism and news media um, as sort of thinking about algorithms as journalistic events um, in that they help to problematize an existing set of, of understandings and, and of what journalism is and ought to be. Um, so, so here I'm really thinking about the power of algorithms uh, in terms of generating new ways of being in the world, of reframing what journalism could be uh, through its encounters with algorithms, right? So how, for instance, notions of news and what journalism, um, sort of the purpose of journalism and what it means to be uh, editorial responsible, for instance, how those notions are also changing uh, by being touched by these ways of, of new inclusions of algorithms, how, how it sort of uh, plays a part in, in challenging existing boundary, boundaries and limitations, right? So everything from how news work is conducted, sort of how um, the journalistic institution itself is reorienting towards these new actors, if you will. So here, sort of this, this idea of the algorithm as an actor that influences sort of that, that shapes how, um, how journalism is, um, is viewing its purpose in the world and how certain actors, so, you know, the journalists themselves, the editors, um, the readers, the investors, um, even the platforms themselves, um, how they all sort of have a, have a part in, in a way, playing a role in this technological drama, to use sort of uh, Pfaffenberg's notion, um, right? So if you think about this sort of almost like a play, almost sort of a, like a theatrical stage, then, then we might begin to sort of map out how, how the, the algorithm in conjunction with all of these different actors also um, shapes new ways of thinking around it, shapes new strategies, shapes new business plans, um, shapes new worries and challenges. So it's, it's sort of full of opportunities and challenges, right? So it's not sort of necessarily and not at all necessarily in a negative sense, right? So it's not just thinking that these algorithms shape sort of um, shape institutional logics in a negative way. Um, a lot of the people that I spoke to for, for this book, we're also seeing sort of the opportunity of having to reorganize, having to sort of um, think about what journalism should be, what their businesses should be, right? So. One of them sort of mentioned that, that he couldn't remember the last time they were actually having sort of this more ontologically uh, oriented discussions uh, in their boardrooms, right? So um, just think, just having all of these very fundamental questions um, revisited about sort of what is the purpose of, of, of our work, um, how sort of how can we use it to our gain while still keeping our journalistic integrity um sort of all these negotiations i think in a way for me that's what what what, what is really um so exciting about this is not so much sort of thinking about it as a change actors but really sort of the kinds of discussions and and uh, negotiations that you're able to study because of it, right? So how are, how are these notions of news, how are notions of editorial responsibility changing? I talk less about politics with a big P in terms of politicians or parliamentary politics or electoral politics. Um, and really think about politics in a very broad sense. Um, and basically I use politics 
in an in an ontological sense, um, meaning that I'm I'm interested in in the world making capacities in these generative capacities of algorithms and. Um, um, and so this understanding is very much influenced by, by the anthropologist um, Anna Maria Moll and her notion of ontological politics specifically, um, which is basically just the idea that, that reality is never given, uh, but made. So it's a way of thinking about this making, um, this making of the world as sort of a political act. Um, and I think in that sense, algorithms are political in as much as they, um, as they really help to make the world appear in certain ways rather than others. Um, so it's, I guess, less politics uh, or it, it's not so much a politics concerned with who gets to speak, um, but rather a kind of reality that takes shape around and because of algorithmic systems and entanglements, right? So, and I think that's also one of my core arguments is that power and politics of algorithms reside not so much in what algorithms do um, or what they are in technical terms, right? But that, that sort of the political lies in when they come to matter uh, on, on the work they, they do on the world. Um, the kinds of actors that get deployed and 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 um, entangled within and for what ends. Uh, so who doesn't find Foucault useful, right? He, he's one of those. Uh, um, I mean, he's one of those rare figures and 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 scholars that sort of seemingly has said it all, um, right? He offers such a rich rich conceptual uh, vocabulary. So for Foucault, building on Jeremy Bentham's um, writings, the Panopticon really offers sort of this diagram or map of thinking about the regulatory force of power. Um, and it's not so much power then as a power over, um, which sort of is also in line with Foucault's um, thinking about power in general, right? So but more about power exercised through um, certain concerted um, distributions of bodies, so lights and gases, and thinking about power of, in terms of how things are arranged in a certain order. Um, and in this case, how, how this arrangement or way of organizing the social then sort of produces um, the relations in which individuals are caught up. And so essentially Foucault shows that spaces are always designed and they're designed to make things seeable and seeable in a specific way. Um, and this of course, um, this, this relates whether we're talking about prisons or digital spaces, algorithmic spaces, um, the world is always sort of, the built world is always made in a specific way. Um, and so while Foucault used the panopticon to talk about this, this regulatory um, force of power within spe this specific arrangement in the present and talked about the threat of, uh, of visibility, right? Of, vi of these prisoners not knowing whether um, they were being watched and therefore sort of internalizing that uncertainty and having to act as if. I was thinking about sort of how, how an algorithmic social news feed in the case of Facebook is of course also an, a specific arrangement. If we think about it as a digital space, um, designed in a certain way, um, designed to make certain things more or less visible, then I was sort of seeing, as you say, the inverse logic, uh, not so much the uncertainty of, of sort of being watched, as it were, um, but the uncertainty of whether what you're saying or what you're contributing is deemed important enough being on top of the news feed is 
sort of a reward. It's not a punishment. Like it's the system works in order to um, to instill in a way this sense that that contributing something important to your friends and family is something to um, to strive for. Um, and it can only per definition be rewarded to those whose contribution is the best. What does this way of arranging bodies and visibility suggest about uh, the ideal user, right? Um, because of course, most people remain so-called lurkers. Uh, we, we still sort of have immense problems with privacy and, and people not want to contribute uh, to begin with. So, so it's not that the algorithm sort of, sort of forces people to participate, um, but that, that this way of working helps to shape and arrange that digital space in this specific way that then again suggests uh, what is the ideal form of behavior on this site according to the ways in which the algorithm um, is organizing that space. You can definitely uh, read and um, sort of find traces of how a platform or a system envisions what an ideal user is, what is sort of the suggested behavior, what are the values, what sort of um, what sort of reward systems are there, right? So what what kind of content is is valued, um, rewarded, whether it's whether it's rewarded by um, heightened visibility on top on top of feeds. Uh, or whether it's even rewarded monetary. In a way, these systems work by, and when I say these systems, these I'm thinking about sort of commercial social media platforms that their, their only goal is to, to keep users to offer, offer a service that makes people return and re return on a regular basis what they do is perhaps um, less important, but having sort of offer something that feels um, important to users, something they have to get back to, um, because at the end of the day, that's sort of uh, how they how they sell their their advertisement, right? These are are basically advertising driven uh, systems whose only goal is really to uh, keep, keep that uh, advertising complex going. Uh, and for that, they just need, they, they need users um, and they need sort of returning, returning users. Many of the people that I've spoken to, um, the so-called users in this book, they are, um, they're users who I came across because they voiced an interest in the workings of these platforms, right? So I, that needs to be said. Um, and perhaps those then would be um, sometimes called very sort of media savvy users, people who think carefully about the systems that they're engaging with um, and wondering sort of why something is shown to them or why it works the way it does. All of them had sort of this experimental attitude towards these systems, um, coming up with techniques that would help them practically navigate in their everyday lives. Um, and so um, to me, that was very generative for thinking about this concept of what I call the algorithmic imaginary um, as a very important aspect to knowing algorithms. Um, and in some cases, as important as sort of knowing the mechanics, if you will. Um, so the, the, the algorithmic imaginary is really just an attempt to sort of articulate what I mean by this generative power um, 
also on behalf of the public's belief and experiences and expectations towards these systems. But I think that the ways in which people encounter and experience algorithms um, shape their ways of thinking and talking and feeling about them, right? So it will definitely also um, shape their discourses and, um, and yeah, ways of talking about algorithms that in turn shape how they're oriented and act on these systems. Thank you.